Well, all right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you're having a good afternoon. Welcome to Anatomy of a Scream, How Resident Evil Structures Its Scares. Before we begin, the court has required me to introduce myself. I am Philip J. Reed, the author of Resident Evil for Boss Fight Books, which comes out on the 25th. They are a great publisher. If you aren't familiar with them, check them out. I recommend starting with Resident Evil. I write for Triple Jump, which is the best channel on YouTube. They hosted a live episode of their show, Worst Games Ever, here at Uplink this morning. Uh, if you missed that, tough bananas. I run Noiseless Chatter, a site at which I wrote about every episode of ALF, and I will never do that again. I spent around a decade working as a critic for Nintendo Life and its family of related sites, and I made two pretty lousy games of my own many years ago, Larry Vell's Traffic Division and Larry Vell's 2, Dead Girls Are Easy. Don't bother looking for them. They're still around, but don't bother looking for them. We are joined and moderated by Melissa, who manages Horror Geek Life. Would you like to say hello, Melissa? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yes, it is. Um, she will be collecting questions throughout the presentation. Uh, I'll answer them afterward in a brief Q&A. So if there's anything that comes to mind while I'm talking, ask away. Anyway, let's talk about Resident Evil. Sorry, uh, this part takes a little while to load. Um, while we're waiting, I might as well provide some background. Writing a book about Resident Evil gave me no shortage of topics to explore. I had the honor of interviewing the live action casts and the voice casts for the game. I worked with psychologists who study fear to learn specifically what happens in our brains and our bodies when we're afraid. And I stalked and murdered a giant snake. One other thing I did, though, I should probably point out for the sake of establishing credibility is I played Resident Evil. Um, I had played it before, of course, to varying degrees of completion across a number of ports and its incredible remake, but it had been years. In my memory, uh, Resident Evil was an important but not especially good game. Uh, I thought I would sit down and write a funny book, pulling the mask away like a Scooby-Doo villain. Instead, though, I found a game that was still pretty damned effective at what it tried to do. You need to brush aside a few cobwebs, but not that many. Uh, it holds up. It's still good. We think about it as a punchline now, but there's a reason it endured long enough in the cultural memory to become one. I get into all of that in the book, but there's only so much I could do with text alone there, which is why I wanted to also do this presentation. Resident Evil achieves its goals with a lot of help from its visuals, and I hope that this serves as a convenient visual companion to a book none of you have read yet. Uh, okay, it loaded. That was a good joke. So, what is horror? Writer Douglas E. Winter says, horror is a genre, or not a genre, it is an emotion. Um, I'm not sure how seriously we should take him after he hits us with a comma splice, but ultimately, I think he makes an important point. Certainly the best horror is emotional. Um, anyone can yell boo. Here, I'll prove it. Boo. And that works, but that's the startle response rather than the horror response. I was on a podcast recently, it's called Game Till 5, and it's very funny and very good, so in all seriousness, you should go check that out. Um, we discussed our favorite monsters. Mine is Frankenberry, but that is not what's relevant here. What's relevant here is that we also spoke about the distinction between horror that attacks your heart and horror that attacks your brain. Yelling boo attacks your heart. Your pulse quickens momentarily. You jump. It's, it's called a jump scare, after all. Uh, you turn to the person who scared you and you say, you scared me, which is honestly about as deep an analysis as that deserves. It's cheap. But because it works, we see it everywhere. And we start to think, well, I got scared, so that must be horror. For example, Five Nights at Freddy's has built an entire very successful series of games around that, co around that concept. I can simulate the Five Nights at Freddy's approach to horror using this PDF. Ready? Boo. Am I simplifying? Of course, I am. But simplifying something is necessary to see what's happening at its core. There are literally thousands of pages about the lore of Five Nights at Freddy's. Most of them were written by MatPat, contradicting the rest of them that were written by MatPat. And maybe stuff in that lore scares you. And that is okay. 
But the games on the whole come down to one single central occurrence. There is nothing in the dark, and then there is. Boo, you say. You scared me. You move on. That's the fear that hits your heart. The fear that hits your mind is very different. That's dread. That's tension. That's the feeling of being haunted. It's not the fear of hearing boo. It's the fear of knowing you could hear it at any moment and can't afford to let your guard down. After you experience that, you don't say, you scared me. You tell your friends about it with as much detail as possible in the hopes that you can get them to feel and understand just a small fraction of what you felt and still carry with you. We find this kind of fear all throughout Resident Evil, and it's often thanks to one of its most antiquated features, the fixed camera. It was the result of technical limitation, of course, but as with the similarly necessary loading screens, Capcom did a great job of making the limitation enhance the experience. If they had to be there, they might as well do the game some good, right? There's an early puzzle in Resident Evil that revolves around hitting switches beneath paintings in an art gallery. The subject of each painting holds the clue to the correct sequence, so you'd think it would be important to, you know, see those paintings on the wall, right? Yes. Sort of. Maybe. But no. Because while the puzzle is the entire point of the room, it's not the point of the game. Capcom doesn't want to stump your brain. It wants to interfere with it. And so we will look at every other angle in the room. Is your attention being drawn to the paintings or toward something else maybe? If you move over to the paintings, you can inspect them and you will be given in text the clues that you need to solve the puzzle. Being able to focus on the paintings might make the puzzle easier, but it would also dilute the horror. It's important that you see the ravens perched above, always. It's important that you see the feathers at your feet, suggesting some previous scuffle. It's important that they are constantly on screen, cawing at you, heckling you, daring you to get the question wrong. It makes it more difficult to focus, but it also lets the consequence of failure literally hang above you. It's important that you get this right. Even if you don't know that failing the puzzle will bring the ravens down upon you, the composition of the scene, of every frame of the scene, makes that a pretty safe guess. If the player had control over the camera, this wouldn't work. And I don't mean it wouldn't work as well, I mean it wouldn't work. If you move the camera to see the pictures more clearly, to study them to the exclusion of everything else in the room, it would be like looking at a puzzle in a book. You would try to solve it by focusing visually on the clues, by concentrating. It wouldn't matter how many birds are above you, out of sight, out of mind. You would see something like this instead. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Maybe if you solved it wrong, the birds could swoop into view and attack you, and you would jump because the game yelled boo. But having the birds always visible above you makes it different. It turns a moment of fright into a looming threat. Thomas Pynchon once wrote, a camera is a gun. Very rarely does that feel more literal than it does in Resident Evil's art gallery. If the option were given, the option would be taken. Intentionally or not, somebody would use that flexibility of the camera to erase the horror. Capcom knows this, and the Resident Evil 2 remake is, a, is good evidence of that. You control the camera in that game, and therefore the way in which the original game structured its scares needed to be overhauled completely. Here's a moment from the original Resident Evil 2 with its fixed camera angles. If you've played the game, you know exactly what's happening here. As you walk around a partition in the Raccoon City police station to get to a door on the other side, you approach a window, and a liquor makes its debut by scampering across the glass from outside. It's a scary and unforgettable moment. It tells you a lot of what you need to know about the creature just from this fleeting, uncomfortable glimpse. It looks disgusting. Uh, it can climb vertical surfaces. It's fast. Before you can even process what you've seen, it's gone. Oh, and it moved in the same direction you're heading as soon as you open that door. So what did the remake do? It did none of that. It couldn't. Uh, the remake chose to let players control the camera. Without the fixed angle, they couldn't count on the moment playing out anywhere near the same way. And so it doesn't play out at all. I'm not speaking hypothetically either. These screenshots are from somebody playing the game for the first time on YouTube. He steers Leon over to the posters to see if he can read what's on them. Then he turns the camera to the wall with the door, because that's where his goal is. The window is still there, just where it was in the original, but it's not the focus. 
it was only the focus in the first place because Capcom made it the focus and they could only make it the focus when they were holding the camera. So how is the liquor introduced in the remake? Well, it's in keeping with the much different way in which the remake presents itself overall. The first liquor encounter is moved to a sequence a bit later in the game. Now it's in a narrow hallway on the second floor. You have your camera pointed ahead because this is your first time in the area and you want to be aware of any danger. Admittedly, there is a door on the left that you might want to investigate, but everything else of interest in the hallway draws your attention toward the center. There's a broken window with the rain splashing inward. There's a lit flashlight shining on the floor. There are dead bodies. Even if you know you want to explore that door ahead on the left, your focus is pulled toward the center of the screen. As you move closer, the liquor on the ceiling, who you probably didn't even notice, grabs one of the bodies below. And the cloud of blood as this happens is definitely enough to get and to hold your attention. And you learn different things in this encounter than you do in the original Resident Evil 2, but you learn just about as much. Uh, you learn that it can grip ceilings. You learn that it has a long reach. You learn that it's vicious and dangerous, ripping through a corpse like wet paper. Smartly, in this situation, Capcom takes your control over the camera into account. It draws your attention to one thing. It seizes it with some unexpected action and then draws it up toward the ceiling where you will actually finally see the monster. It's well done. Um, is one approach better than the other? That's entirely up to you. But the fact that each version of the encounter is structured completely differently reinforces the importance of structure. In either case, they could have simply had Bonnie pop up and yell boo. Instead, Capcom made sure that the encounter would haunt, and each scare was tailored to a completely different set of circumstances. What if you don't allow for those circumstances? Uh, well, we can move just one game backward and check out Resident Evil 7. It's overall a great game, so I am not picking on it, but there is one scene someone pointed out to me, and it has stuck with me ever since. It's when you follow Marguerite underground. You head into this room with a big hole under the floorboards. Great. There's only one way forward, and there's nothing especially distracting. Great. The bright area ahead of you gets your attention as it should. Great. There's a lantern at the bottom of the hole, and that is where you need to go. But weirdly, Capcom plays a loud creaking sound out of nowhere. Why would they play that sound in complete isolation so that you're guaranteed to hear and to notice it if they don't want you to look around and investigate? Look around, though, and, and you'll find nothing. Nothing of any significance has changed in the room. Turn back, and the lantern is gone. If you don't investigate, you get to see the actual scare. Marguerite's gross, long spider arm reaching out from the side of the hole and grabbing the lantern. If there were a fixed camera, there would be no problem. Nobody would look away because they can't look away. But with a free camera, people are going to turn and try to find the source of the sound. In fact, they would have to suppress every survival instinct not to. It's a house full of danger and traps. You need to have your wits about you. But seeing this scare requires you to... I haven't played in VR. Maybe that sound is Marguerite crawling around, and that's more obviously the case with a great sound system or something, and that is fine. But from the playthroughs I've seen, this is not a rare occasion. People look around, people explore new areas, people want to focus on things that don't need their attention, and so they overlook the things that do. You can do off-screen scares. You can frighten people with sounds that don't have a distinct source. But with fixed cameras, the developers can always choose which of those scares are off-screen. With player-controlled cameras, they can't. Maybe some of them will be off-screen, maybe all of them will, maybe none of them will. The developers aren't the ones regulating them at that point. It can end up being too full or too empty a whole horror experience. And anytime they won't know if it was their fault for focusing on something else or the developer's fault for structuring it poorly. Do you want to know what other classic horror game understood and demonstrated this the very same year as Resident Evil? It was that horror masterpiece we know as Super Mario 64. Famously, this was Mario's 3D platforming debut. There were 3D platformers that preceded it, but I think it's fair to say that they were among the worst things produced by human hands. Part of the problem with those is that neither gamers nor developers quite knew what to do with a free camera, let alone how to meet each other in the middle. 
Mario 64 opened with a crucial bit of context. It showed us Lakitu, a hovering turtle man, uh, following us around with a camera. It gave our brains something to work with and a way to understand the angles we were seeing, uh, as well as what would happen when we adjusted them. It's a strange thing to think about now, but it really was something people were learning for the first time. Do you think that's me romanticizing the past? Well, I do that constantly, so I get it. But as a contemporary point of comparison, I found a review of Resident Evil from 1996. That's the year of its release. The reviewer claims that the game is seen from the perspective of security cameras hidden around the mansion. He doesn't say that's what it's like. He says that's what it is. And to be clear, that is not stated or supported in any way by the game or its marketing materials. It's just how his brain was able to process what he was seeing. And he didn't even know he was reaching for an explanation, I'm sure. At the time, players needed context for the ways in which these fancy new cameras were showing them the action. Anyway, why am I talking about Resident Evil? Let's get back to Mario 64, which blew minds around the world by giving the player what was, at the time, a remarkable amount of control over the camera. It showed an entire industry, how camera control could work and what could be achieved with it. And it knew, innately knew, that if the game wanted to scare people, a free camera wouldn't do it. So when you first meet the booze in Peach's castle, you've got the same amount of camera control that you ever had. But then you cross the threshold into their world and things change. You do get limited camera control at various points here, but importantly, the game seizes control over your perspective frequently. Inside that haunted mansion, you get precious little ability to decide what you see. And there's one important moment that wouldn't have worked without it. You need to see this piano when you enter the room. You need it to stay in your field of view as you move around. You need it to be in frame no matter what else you would like to investigate. And so the game refuses to let the camera's gaze be pulled from the piano. So you might as well check it out and it's gonna eat you. All kidding aside, that moment is as indelible as anything in Resident Evil. Uh, despite Mario 64 not being a horror game, in its horror level, it knew the importance of structuring a scare. The best part is that you will almost certainly trigger that piano before you need to find the red coins. You'll notice one behind it as it chews the spine out of your body, so the entire rest of the time you're playing, you will be aware that you need to go back and knowingly trigger that thing at least once more to get that coin. And that is some decent dread for a kid's game. So yes, it's not that you can only structure your scares with fixed cameras, to be clear. It's just that with a fixed camera, your scare is structured by default. You are placing things onto a screen and the composition of that screen will not change. Without fixed cameras, it will change and you need to account for that. You need to make it clear to the player what they should focus on. So let's play a little game called What the Actual Hell Am I Supposed to Focus On? Ready? All you need to do is take a look at these screenshots and tell me, what the actual hell am I supposed to focus on? Round one. Round two. Round three. Round four. And the answer to all of those is, I don't know. I've played those games, I've played those levels, I took the screenshots, and I don't know. In some cases, there is lighting, but it guides you nowhere. In some cases, there are dead ends that are indistinguishable from the path forward. In some cases, a hidden item is in a place suggested by the game. In other cases, a hidden item is in no way suggested by the game. And in most cases, nothing is anywhere. In all cases, something jumps out at you and yells, boo. Your heart skips, you shoot it, and you're back to wondering what the actual hell you are supposed to focus on. In this example, this is Deadly Premonition, here are all of the things one could reasonably be expected to focus on. But which of them are you incentivized to focus on? In other words, what is the goal and what is the distraction? It's compounded even further by the fact that you can look around and find still more potential points of interest and interaction behind you. So let's play one more round. You ready? Round five. What am I supposed to focus on? The journal. Or is it? Perhaps it's, it's the journal. It is the journal. It's clearly and unquestionably the journal. The way the scene is constructed and framed and lit makes it clear 
that even though it's not at the center of the frame, it is the center of attention. It is the journal. There is not room for debate. But why is the journal the center of attention? Because it contains important story information and lore that will help you to, I am, I am kidding, of course. It is the center of attention because that's where the game needs you to be. You need to see it. You need to approach it. And then you need to read it. So your back is turned. And yes, see, Resident Evil's fixed camera angles take their cues from classic horror cinema. And this is a classic horror movie moment. It's also one that can't be done in first person games, for instance, for obvious reasons. This is the it's behind you moment in which you as a viewer are aware of the danger before the character is. It's also a crucial way of making zombies scary again, at least for a moment. By this point in the game, you've seen plenty of them. Maybe they still make your heart pound a bit, but if you've made it into this room, you know how to deal with them. You may not be an expert, but you know how to react to them. This moment, which turns a document into an incredible little trap, gives them a new way to scare. The room is tight. The zombie gets to move in on you before you get to react. It doesn't matter how well you have learned to deal with them because it already has the upper hand. Kill it, and then you get to read the journal, which reveals who this person was. Uh, in theory, Capcom could have let you read it first, but that would have reduced the impact of the scare. Reading the first-hand account of a man turning into a zombie would put you into the mind of a zombie in this room, at this desk, where you are. By withholding the contents of the document until after the ambush, the intrusion, the intrusion is a genuine one, and you will remember it. You'll think twice about closets and cupboards and anything else that could conceivably hide a zombie. In the blink of an eye, the monster you thought you understood has a whole new way of attacking that you never saw coming. How many other zombies come climbing out of furniture for the rest of the game? It doesn't matter, does it? What matters is that they can't. It's a brand new flavor of tension that you will have to carry with you until you die. Resident Evil 4 does have an equivalent, sort of. Um, it comes much later in the game, and it doesn't really change the way we think about monster possibilities, because Resident Evil 4 already has a movable camera, meaning we are used to things popping out at us from directions we aren't facing. Here, though, the game has to go through a lot of trouble in order to structure this scare properly. With a fixed camera, they could have simply reenacted the blocking of the liquor introduction in the original Resident Evil 2, or they could have stuck a lamp on a desk shining down on some ammo so that Leon would turn away from the oven. Instead, they need to essentially build the entire room as a cow's path through a slaughterhouse. Keep the player moving, don't distract, wind them around, and get them into precisely the necessary position so that they will be scared when the spooky man jumps out of the oven and yells boo. It's entirely down to the camera. The more freedom you give to the player, the more you have to work to restrict it when restriction is necessary. In the first game, the only restriction is that you can't interrupt Jill's animation as she investigates the book, which makes sense. Why would she stop investigating it? She's not aware of the danger. Leon clearly is. Uh, what's more, he's already facing the danger. And unlike the zombie in the first game, this one is artificially weaker. One shot from any weapon, I think, takes it down. That's it. It's a lot of work to make someone jump for a second and say, you scared me. But don't take my word for it. Even Leon realizes how contrived this is. I do think Resident Evil 4 is a scary game. Uh, I'm not trying to use this as an example of why it's inferior to the first game or any game. But look at how much trouble it has to go through in order to structure a scare that isn't nearly as good as one in the very first game. All of this is to say that the man in the oven is not well done. <coughs> Resident Evil 4 was the first proper mainline Resident Evil game to give players control over the camera, being as the series until then didn't only employ a fixed camera, but was universally known for its fixed camera. It wasn't a solution that could be applied without serious design consideration. So did they solve the problem of focusing attention? Kind of. When you first enter the village, for instance, it is immediately, by far, the most open the series has ever been. What should you look at? What should you explore? What's important? Where does this visual journey begin? A player needs to know 
if you care to tease out any kind of emotional response, such as, say, horror. So instead of guiding the player toward anything, the game provides a button prompt. Press the button to pull out your binoculars. You can look around, but clearly your attention is drawn to the bonfire with the body of your chauffeur hanging in the middle of it. It's far from an elegant solution, and it's a shame that this is how the game introduces its new approach. Uh, at the time, though, there wasn't a more obvious way to do it. When the camera can't suggest to players what to focus on, the game has to explicitly tell them instead. There are better structured scares in Resident Evil 4, and there are worse structured scares in Resident Evil 1. I want to make that clear. But the binoculars and the journal, they're both early game scares that do a really good job of illustrating the design considerations necessary with each of the two approaches. The camera does more than emphasize danger and spotlight important things, though. It builds atmosphere. When you first enter the mansion in Resident Evil, the camera never lets you forget just how much larger the Spencer Mansion is than you are. You're made to feel tiny and insignificant with the camera keeping its distance to suggest vulnerability. If you had control over the camera, would you keep it anywhere near this distance from the action? Of course not. But with the fixed camera, Capcom had the opportunity to construct this visually like the opening scene in a movie. It wants you to see the eerie stillness. You aren't even alone. But you feel alone, because the three of you can't fill the space around you. No matter where you look, the place stretches off into unknowable, overwhelming emptiness. With camera control, you would look at objects. You would look at textures. You would look at character models. You would see if maybe you could look out the window. Um, without control, there's no escape from the oppressive emptiness. And that makes the entire thing feel even more empty when you return to this room to find your companions gone. Having them at your side did very little to make you feel safe or secure, but their absence is unbearable. And it's one that only works as well as it does because Capcom, again, gets to choose the camera angles. It matches them so that, the, so that you get the same view it gave you before, only now it's urgently emptier. Uh, without fixed cameras, that wouldn't have worked. Perhaps you would spend your initial time in the entry hall looking at one thing, and then when you returned, you would look at another. At the very least, the direction you're facing would change. It would be the same room, but it wouldn't look the same, making the absence of your allies hit that much less hard. They're gone now is not as strong an emotion as the world has changed around me. The Resident Evil team gets pretty artful about this as well. In fact, the camera does most of the heavy lifting in what became one of the game's most famous moments. Getting the shotgun is memorable in either route, but for very different reasons. For Chris, it's a puzzle to be solved, and you can only solve it a good way into the game. It represents a nice increase to your firepower, so you remember it as being a point at which the balance swings a bit in your favor. With Jill, though, you can, you can still solve the puzzle. Uh, most folks won't do that. Or rather, they may attempt to solve the puzzle before they actually can, locking them into a much different kind of sequence. For her, the result is little more than a cutscene with some interactivity, which wouldn't be nearly as scary or tense or memorable without the fixed camera. Before you enter the sequence, the camera hangs above you in the hallway. Not really notable on its own. By this point, we've seen the camera bear down at us from ceiling level more times than we can count. Walk through the door, and the camera is still at ceiling level. But can you spot the difference? Yeah. Uh, the, the ceiling is quite a lot higher in this room. In neither case do we need to see the ceiling. In fact, we can't. It's just that we are used to the camera being wherever the wall meets the ceiling. And so when it retreats as far as it does here, turning us into a little insect beneath a magnifying glass, as opposed to a human walking through some hallways, you feel it. It's an effective and silent way of revealing a massive shift in scale. Also, the room is a bit too small to have a ceiling quite so high, isn't it? It's disorienting, uh, and it makes you feel uneasy. Rooms should be wider than they are tall. This isn't right. Move through into the next room, and reality reasserts itself. This is a room we can feel comfortable in, and we do. Uh, we lift the shotgun from the hooks on the wall, and the only way back out is the way we came. Nothing happened in that room on the way in, but its orientation made it pretty clear that it was designed for a purpose.
that purpose is to crush us into a fine paste. If we are playing as Chris, we can return to that little parlor and hang the shotgun back on the hooks until we figure out what we need to do to keep it. Jill can't do that. Uh, the door locks behind her when she re-enters this unnervingly tall room. And that's when the camera pulls this interesting trick. Instead of being at ceiling height, it is now at floor level. As we get to see the ceiling at last, we see it pressing down upon us. There's no way out. And the camera emphasizes this claustrophobia masterfully. The room is so small, you can barely move without feeling like you're going to bump into the camera. And every time the angle shifts, it shows you there's no way out. There is nothing you're missing. There are no items in this room to investigate, no switches to throw, no puzzles to solve. It's just this inexorable crushing force that slowly presses into frame from above and you're stuck. Until, of course, Barry shows up to rescue you in a scene that is not amusing or memorable in any way. If you could move the camera, none of that would have worked as well. You might never glance upward as you step into the room in the first place, so you would never notice that it's abnormally tall. As the ceiling crushes down, you could use the camera to scan the room for a way out. There would still not be a way out, but standing still and rotating the camera to establish this, that's a much different experience from running around in a panic, hoping the camera angle will shift and reveal something you've never noticed before. Resident Evil 4 has a similar crushing ceiling scene with, of course, camera control. And it's no longer a brilliant, inescapable panic that the scene triggers. It's a sharpshooting challenge. You don't scramble for an escape. You unholster your gun and you shoot an obstacle. It hits your heart. The first game hits your mind. Again, there's no correct way to do these things, just preferred ways and ways that are effective for their contexts. The first Resident Evil takes its inspiration from classical horror. Resident Evil 4 and 5 take their inspiration from modern horror. What's the difference? Well, do a little experiment. The next time you watch a scary movie, take note of how often something appears out of nowhere, even something harmless, and it's accompanied by a shrill musical sting. If it's a film from the past couple of decades, you'll see just how often we've come to rely on that. Then go back and watch a scary movie from half a century ago. Make note of how rarely that happens, and indeed how often nothing happens. Decide which movie is guiding your emotional response and which movie is hammering it. We all have our preferences, but the trend has moved toward jostling our hearts rather than our minds. Then again, we don't need to turn to movies to illustrate this trend. We can turn right back to Resident Evil. Resident Evil 3's nemesis is a looming threat, never letting you get comfortable with where you are or where you need to go next, even on repeat playthroughs, because his appearances are randomized. The potential for him showing up keeps you on your toes. You always need to have some kind of strategy in mind, because his reaction time will certainly be quicker than yours. Alternatively, Resident Evil 3's nemesis is a predictable obstacle, allowing you to get very comfortable with the sequence of the game's events, especially on repeat playthroughs, as his appearances are scripted to occur in very specific places. The potential for him popping up and yelling boo means you might sometimes say you scared me, but you never need to worry about strat uh, strategy because the game will tell you what buttons you need to press and when. Again, I'm simplifying, but again, I am doing it to make a point. The original version of Nemesis was classical horror, a lurking, dangerous presence that felt as though it could show up at any time. He was powerful enough that you would need to improvise in ways you could never predict. Playing the game multiple times helped, but never removed that dark cloud of horror hanging over your head. He could find you in completely different circumstances every time you played. You could know the game like the back of your hand, and you would still not be able to let your guard down. The remake version of Nemesis is a jump scare. I hate to say it, because I do think the game is better than its reputation suggests, but as a horror game, it has a shelf life. You learn when to expect him. You can plan for it. And I don't just mean you can plan to have enough ammo to shoot at him. I mean, you can plan to not be afraid. And that is absolutely fatal for any sense of horror. You'll still jump when he yells boo, but I feel confident in saying that this version of Nemesis 
will not haunt dreams the way the original did. This version of Nemesis will not make kids afraid to turn on the console. Why would it? They will encounter him, they will press the button to get past him, and not have to worry about him again, because Capcom spread the encounters apart in predictable rhythms, so that nobody would ever have to deal with anything unexpected. That is a huge downgrade. It took one of the most famous and genuine threats in the series and basically turned it into a commercial break. He may be bigger and look better, but in the end, that isn't what matters. Uh, to paraphrase my famous Uncle Jimmy, he's just tall, that's all. The remade Nemesis represents all of the worst differences between modern and classical horror. And I will need to move on now because I'm gradually talking myself into hating this game. Uh, the whole reason for discussing any of this, of course, was to prove that the original Resident Evil does not rely on jump scares, and never did, nor is it known for employing them at any point, especially here. Okay, obviously this, this is a jump scare. This is one of the most famous jump scares in video game history. I don't even need to show you more. You know exactly what this is, and you know how it pans out. What you may not know is what elevates this above Bonnie popping out and yelling boo. Is this a more intelligently constructed scare? If so, why? The answers are yes, and I'll tell you. What's really interesting about the dog hallway is that the camera seems to go out of its way to prove, not suggest, but actually prove that you aren't in any danger. It's a long, narrow hall. There's no room for anything to hide. There are small furniture items scattered here and there, but that's it. Unless something is hidden in them or behind them, you're safe, and you can investigate them as much as you please to reassure yourself that there is nothing there of interest. The camera is perfectly happy to show you both that there is nothing behind you and nothing ahead of you. The worst case scenario, and it is a seemingly likely one, uh, I admit, is that there might be something waiting for you around that distant corner. Until you get there, though, you're safe. You can breathe, and so you move forward, and yeah, it, yeah, it happens. And uh, the shock of it makes for a jump scare because, you know, look at it. But that's not all that's happening here. At this point, you don't know how to deal with the dogs. You know they're dangerous because you watched them eat your colleagues when the games began. Uh, but until now, the dogs were outside. You didn't have to face them. They were a plot device. They were not an enemy. You can fight, as always, but remember that here, at this early point in the game, you are still getting the hang of big, slow, dumb zombies. Uh, a fast-moving, aggressive enemy like this isn't something you are prepared for, and even if you want to fight it, that would require turning around and confronting it in a narrow space with very little room for maneuvering. Additionally, the zombies have taught you that there's nothing to be gained from fighting. Enemies don't drop anything helpful. All they do is drain your resources. Fighting has already been uniformly discouraged. It's smarter to just outrun the damn thing, or at least try. And sure enough, that's what the game just about insists you do. The dog doesn't crash through the window until you pass a certain point in the hallway, cutting off your retreat. You're already moving away from it. You might as well keep doing that, rather than expend the effort of slowly turning around and trying to kill it. So you keep moving. And if there is something around that corner, well, you're going to have to deal with that when you get there. As you turn that corner, though, you see there isn't anything to worry about. Thank the Lord. You keep, you just keep moving. You're, you're free. You're okay, as long as you can stay ahead of the danger. And then the danger is ahead of you. Still behind you, but now also ahead of you. Uh, you are even more discouraged from fighting. If combat didn't feel like much of an option with only one dog, it's certainly no more appealing now. But there's no escape without pushing through the danger. Either direction is the wrong answer, but so is staying still. If you're going to get anything out of this at all, you need to push through. Through the panic, through the fear, through the anger, and just hope to God that the dogs don't rip too much of your flesh off as you go. It is a pretty good scene, I think. It's pretty perfectly constructed, especially considering Bonnie could have just popped out and yelled boo. Which basically is what happens in the game from which Resident Evil stole most of its best ideas, uh, alone in the dark. Here we control the Pringles man as he solves puzzles and copes with strictly limited resources in a zombie infested mansion. And one of the early scares in this game also revolves 
around little dog creatures crashing through a window to attack. And yet that's it. It employs the same fixed camera approach of Resident Evil, but it doesn't quite know how to use it. The window is always in the background. And the thing about windows, you can quote me on this, is that you can see what's on the other side. So the little creature hops along and it peers inside and then it pops on through and uh, that's, that's about it. Did it scare anyone? Well, I know it scared me when I was a kid, but that was mainly because I was very, very stupid. The reason I bring it up here though is so that you don't pull from this presentation the lesson that fixed cameras are automatically superior. In this case, it was actually pretty lousy. Also, uh, a purple monster against a purple wall, it doesn't read all that well visually. So take that game nobody's cared about for 30 years. The point, of course, is that structuring scares is all about understanding the tools you are using well enough that you know how to push them further. You can always settle for Bonnie jumping out and yelling boo. Just know that whenever that happens, the developers could have tried a lot harder and baby, you can boo them right back. I hope you enjoyed this look at some of the specific ways Resident Evil made you wet yourself. Um, check out the book if you're interested in more. It's really good. I can say that because I wrote it. Uh, you can pre-order it right now on Amazon or at bossfightbooks.com. It's also in the Expo Center um, here at Uplink, so check it out. You can also check me out at Noiseless Chatter and definitely check out Melissa, our esteemed moderator at Horror Geek Life. Um, her stuff is much better than mine, so don't miss that. That's all for the presentation. So um, Melissa, I'm gonna open the floor to some questions if you have any to pass along. Yeah, Rob was actually wondering if you get um, scared whenever you play horror games. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess someone might assume that I don't or that it's difficult to scare me. It is actually extraordinarily easy to scare me. Uh, I I would say this, of course, but I see that as a benefit. Um, Shinji Mikami, actually, I don't remember exactly when the interview was. I found it when I was uh, doing research for the book. He mentioned that he's a scaredy cat. And I think, and to be clear, he's he was the director behind the original Resident Evil, Resident Evil 4, and the remake of Resident Evil 1. So three of the best games in, in the series. Um, he didn't go on to say this, but it did get my brain going. And I think somebody who isn't scared easily probably isn't going to be very good at creating horror um, because he won't understand, he or she won't understand that threshold. Um, if nothing is keeping them awake at night, if nothing is making them feel dread, then I think they're going to be more compelled to just throw some blood everywhere and hope for the best. Um, but yeah, Mikami admitted to being a big baby. I am also a very big baby, um, which I think allows me to kind of step back from it and ask myself, why am I being affected in this way? Um, Marissa wants to know if you could go back and change anything about your favorite horror game, what would it be? <sighs> God, I would really have to think about this because I know, I know that there's a specific answer. There's one thing, and it probably did come from the Resident Evil remake uh, when I was replaying it for the book, where I just realized, God, this is, it's, this is nearly perfect. And then you get to this kind of moment, oh, it sort of sucks. Um, God, I would really have to think about that. Um, I think even the Resident Evil 2 remake had a section that I dreaded every time I ended up going back to it. I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on this. Um, I may have to come back and answer that at a later point. Um, well, I, basically, I guess maybe the answer is just, uh, I, I would go back and just find these weaker moments. And I think it would be okay to just replace them with nothing rather than a frustrating enemy. Um, oh God, here we go. Let me go with Code Veronica. Not my favorite Resident Evil game, but it's one that I really, really love. And there is a section, it's near a save room, and there's something else. So um, I forget what the other destination is, but it's it's an area I ended up having to walk back and forth through multiple times. And there were a bunch of uh, poisonous insects flying around, poisonous moths. And it was not fun. It was extremely frustrating. And you can waste all your ammo killing them or not. They come back either way. And it is just... Uh, extraordinarily irritating. And 
would it be scarier to not have enemies in that corridor? Well, probably not, but the game would have been better. Uh, it would have at least been more enjoyable. And that is something I really dislike, basically. It stands out when a game does, does everything or nearly everything so well that there's a section that it ends up doing poorly. Uh, earlier in the presentation, we showed screenshots from like Doom 3 and Deadly Premonition, and these are games that I like, uh, but they also do a lot of things very poorly. So the bad moments don't stand out quite as much. In a game like Code Veronica, my god, the bad moments stand out because most of it's pretty damn good. And then she also wants to know um, if you have any recommendations for horror games, portable horror, horror games for um, PSP, Switch, DS. Oh, uh, PSP, I throw up my hands. I have one. Uh, I admit my experience with that is it's very, very low. Um, however, uh, the Switch, just recently I played a game called Detention. I got it on sale goodness knows how long ago. It could have been a year or more. I think I got it on sale for 50 cents, and I just grabbed it and uh, finally got around to playing it just a matter of weeks ago. I thought it was phenomenal. It was um, not difficult, um, but extraordinarily unnerving, and it stuck with you. And that, honestly, like Deadly Premonition, it was one of those games that um, when something goes wrong, when there's a typo, or there's a visual that doesn't quite display properly, it actually sort of uh, inadvertently complements the experience. And uh, I, I can't say enough good about detention, but at the same time, I don't want to spoil anything. What I will say is that uh, I played it. I found it very effective. I finished it, and I looked it up afterward. I didn't want any spoilers. And looking into it afterward and realizing, I'm not realizing, I'm sorry, learning the real-world inspiration behind that game uh, just made it even more harrowing. So... There you go. You, you want a good portable horror recommendation? Obviously, any of the Resident Evils. Um, those are, I think, most of them are on Switch. Some of them, or one of them at least, has been ported to the DS. But yeah, go out there and grab uh, Detention. I think you'll enjoy that. And if I can also just make one recommendation, it's an indie game that uh, oh, please do. on the Switch, um, but it's Darkwood. And uh, those developers are really great guys, and they just got their game over, and uh, it's been on Steam before then. But it's also a really good one. Very dark, very um, thick atmosphere, so very creepy. Highly recommend. Darkwood. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that Darkwood. one. Darkwood. Um, and then Marissa has one more question, and uh, she wants to know what game scarred you, what horror game scarred you for a period of time. <laughs> You know, I, my brain wants to find something relatively recent, I guess, so I can sound cool. Um, but the fact is, if it were recent, I, I can't really promise it has scarred me. Uh, time has not yet told. But from when I was a kid, um, what scarred me was honestly the first Resident Evil. I remember playing that game. I didn't own it. I didn't even have a PlayStation. A friend of mine brought it over. And uh, I, I played it for, who knows, an a number of hours and then my friend left and took the game away and I went to bed that night and I could not stop thinking about it and it I don't know if it gave me nightmares but it certainly didn't let me go when it was time for bed um and a little bit later well quite a bit later actually um when the remake came out for the GameCube I went in thinking, okay, I'm going to be brave now because I know Resident Evil. I, I know the dogs are coming. I know all this stuff is going to happen and I will not be afraid. Um, <laughs> and I was afraid. Uh, I think I would have been anyway, but they did scramble some things up. Fine. You know, I jumped, Bonnie popped out and, and yelled boo. But Lisa Trevor, the story of Lisa Trevor, as I played the remake and pieced together things from the documents and then Jesus Christ seeing her for the first time in the flesh, I definitely um, had nightmares about that. And uh, I'll just answer one more really quickly was Majora's Mask. I think that game, <laughs> not even close to one of the scariest games I've ever played, but that has probably given me more nightmares than anything else. And then another question is, do you prefer the classic RE or the remake, the GameCube version? <sighs> different, uh, let's see, different reasons for loving both. Overall, I have to go with the remake. Um, even if it were exactly the same game, excuse me, um, but it looked better, 
and you know and they added the lisa trevor story because i really like that i would end up going with that but the fact is i, I don't know just everything about that game is so well constructed and it, it's really good at inspiring that kind of dread mechanically right now um for instance the crimson heads i know exactly how to deal with them and if you haven't played it those are you you kill a normal zombie and its body just lies around and then you come back later and the body is still there and then at some point in the game those bodies reanimate again and now they are much faster and they're more powerful and it's it's scary it's a it's a you know spooky moment the first time you see one of those things get back up um so right now i'm describing it to you i'm fully aware of it i i know about when to expect them and i know how to deal with them and uh, yeah they absolutely scare the pants out of me every single time still the original resident evil as you saw going through this presentation i'm brave enough to go through and take some screen grabs and uh you know maybe get some shivers now and then but the gamecube one man that one it still still hits pretty hard And then I actually had a question. Um, so I've read your book, as you know, I reviewed it for my publication and it's great. You go through a lot of interviews with the original cast of the Resident Evil game. Um, you know, I know that probably a lot of blood, sweat and tears went into this book, but uh, what was your favorite moment while making this book? Who was your favorite interview or what, what was it? It's, um... Well, it's like being asked to choose your favorite child. Um, so the answer is I, I'll go with the first one. Um, no, of course it was. It actually it did end up being the first one. It was uh, Charlie Krislovsky, who was the actor who played Chris Redfield, but only in um, uh, in the live action cutscenes. So even there, where physically he's inhabiting the character, his voice was overdubbed, as was everybody. But Charlie Krislovsky physically embodied um, Chris Redfield for those scenes. And he was the first one that got back to me about an interview. And I, it really was like hearing from an old friend. And it's, he's just such a friendly, pleasant human being. And I can say that about, well, literally everybody I interviewed. I almost said every, you know, pretty much everyone who works on Resident Evil. But uh, I can't say that for a fact. The ones I've interviewed, though, they're just lovely human beings. And listening to him talk about his acting career and, uh, you know, he moved to Japan to start one and got a job at, a, a, what do you call it, a, a talent agency. And he sort of dabbled with this minor degree of fame and then came back here. And I don't know, it was just a very human story that uh, I don't want to say I didn't expect to find. I didn't know what I would find, but I certainly didn't think I would meet, you know, just sort of this cuddly, wonderful human that I was uh, so glad to make contact with. Yeah, he was great. They were all and great, but he was great. I just want to note, someone asked where they could find the book. So I um, posted the Amazon link for your book in the comments. So if anyone wants yes, to- Yes, thank you for doing so. Um, that Amazon link, it, it, it's good. I, I, I didn't click it. I'm assuming you put the right link. Um, <laughs> but <Hope so. laughs> if you go there, if you go there now, you can get the uh, digital version. For some reason, Amazon's taking a little while to display the uh, paperback version. Paperback ones do exist. If you go to bossfightbooks.com, you can get it there. There's an expo section here on Uplink. You can, um, I think, you can get either version there. Basically, whatever you prefer. Um, but yeah, my God, thank you for uh, thank you for looking. I actually put that Melissa, link for the for the uh, for the physical. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, Melissa, I'm going to jump back a few questions. Did you have any uh, recommendations regarding the PSP and horror games? I don't know if you have more um, experience there than I do. I don't. Um, you know, I, I never owned one. <laughs> I didn't either until relatively recently, uh, well, you know, past three or four years, I guess. And the only reason I got it was because uh, Parasite Eve had a third game that was only on the PSP. And it's an awesome series. So, yeah, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to track down a PSP and I'm going to play this third game. And I, I don't want to say I, I looked into the third game very deeply, but I think I read enough about the third game to realize uh, maybe I shouldn't play it. Maybe I should just enjoy my memories of the first two games. Yeah, you Maybe know, looking day. at looking at the games right now, I just looked out of curiosity. Um, Manhunt Two, that was always one of my favorites. <laughs> That's a it's a classic. It's an oldie. <laughs> oh yeah, one of the greats. Mm -hmm. um, well, I am happy to keep answering questions. One thing I will say for 
folks tuning in, I don't know how many other panels you saw, pretty much at, um, well, for me, it'll be three o'clock, pretty much when the hour returns, this will just stop. So let, <laughs> I will keep answering questions as, as um, long as I can, but let me say my goodbye right now, just in case uh, we do get cut off. Genuinely, thank you um, for tuning in. That means a lot. Uh, you've listened to me babble on about nonsense, and I really do appreciate that. Uh, do look into the book. Feel free. You can contact me at Noiseless Chatter, or if you Google the book, you'll find me. Um, feel free to reach out if you do end up with any questions, anything else that you uh, want to address. If you want to tell me I did a really poor job, I can't stop you from doing that, but uh, <laughs> I'll leave that to your discretion. Or maybe that was it. Was that all our questions? Um, yeah, we have a couple more comments, but that those are our questions. I think it, it displays, the chat does display for me. It's not quite clear. I'm scrolling up right back now. Here we go. Um, someone mentioned Viviette. Mm -hmm. I am assuming I am pronouncing that correctly. Um, uh, he says it's on the Switch. I don't know if I have it. That's another one that I have seen on sale many times and never got around to it. So I'm just pointing that out. If someone else is looking for a Switch suggestion, evidently Viviette is pretty good. And thank you, uh, Kyle, I think your name was. Thank you for putting that on my radar, I will grab that. And for the switch, I can. Oh, oh uh, no, go, go for and it. For the switch, I can also say um, another developer I really like is uh, Bloober Team, and they did Layers of Fear, uh, Observer. They did the last Blair Witch game that just came out, and I believe. Oh wow! Yeah, I believe all of their uh, games are now on the Switch as well. And their Layers of Fear, I just adore. I, I love both of those games, the first two. So. I've heard very good yeah. things. Um, what I was going to point out, just to anybody here and interested, of course, I wrote the Resident Evil book, so I am going to hope you, know, hope you buy it. <laughs> but even if you're not interested in that, do check out Boss Fight Books. Uh, if you're interested in horror, we have one on Silent Hill 2, which is coming out within the next few months. I forget exactly when. Majora's Mask, that one I believe is coming out next month. Um, I think there are a few other horror adjacent games in um, in their run. They've had 26 of them now that have been released. Uh, so do take a look and check them out. They're, they're really good. I started uh, as a fan of their first batch of releases and now eventually I, I ended up uh, writing one, which is mind blowing to me and I expect to wake up at any point. But yes, if you buy my book, great, thank you. If you don't, uh, also fine, but yeah, check out Boss Fight Books. There's a really, really good selection there. Oh, I think some, I just saw a Larry, <laughs> a Larry Bell's question come up. Um, yeah, I, I'm assuming I'm, maybe that thing came out in 1999. The rest of these I can look up online. Larry Bell's was just a really crappy game I made myself, so there's not much information about it, but I, I guess that's about right. It's been 20 years and we are very old now. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. Definitely check out Melissa at Horror Geek Life, and you can check me out at Noiseless Chatter and obviously Boss Fight Books.